Okay. Yeah, so I think uh, I have a very wonderful panel. Uh, in a way, it's a complementary and also a little bit competitive because we have the most uh, uh, cost sensitive materials at the beginning and the end of the cell lines, towards the end of the cell lines, which is uh, silicon and silver. Then we have two leading production equipment suppliers, which are really the crux of the top con, like how to form the, the, the important uh, top con layer. So one route is uh, LPCVD, another way is uh, PCVD in combination with ALD or PCVD all alone. So welcome. So, you know, uh, ju just if you look from the last year, so if you remember, we also did the same conference uh, last year. Uh, and when we organized the conference, the solar industry was uh, in a strong capex free, uh, I would say, because uh, nearly every leading company was expanding and many newcomers were also there in the picture. And there were also several discussions about manufacturing outside of China and the discussions were pretty intense. So now the situation has changed really a lot. There are hefty overcapacities all across the value chain. And we also see consolidations. But on the other hand, expansion is kind of continuing in few areas, you know, towards Topcon, Chinese expansions to the US, as well as some local companies trying to start uh, production in regions or nations that want to get, uh, uh, you know, less dependent on supply chains. And all this is happening in an environment that is really characterized by further growth and uh, cost and pricing pressure. So how is the cell production capacity expansion landscape as uh, looking from your point? So this is a question to all. Anyone can start. Uh, yeah, I think from, oh, go ahead. Yeah, please, <laughs> go ahead. So, okay, thank you. I think from our point of view, I mean, 2023 was really an exceptional, an exceptional year. And I think we can all agree, we, nobody was expecting that it goes on like this now in 24. And in China, I think we still see some um, business, at least for us. So we still have a lot to do, mainly on still going towards TopCon from a perk um, side. But also clearly on the international market, there is traction that you can see that it's moving more to get more independent from China. Oh, sorry. Yuchin, you just started. What's your opinion? I, I, I was saying, I, I would like to say for for high efficiency cell production line, the the capacity for high efficiency product uh, capacity is also wanted and also need to to um how can I say this way? So it's it's just a, like a after three years, a the the cell production line and also the all the wafer production line they all goes changing presume higher efficiency perfume presume a uh, higher quality the capacity is moving like this way <laughs> yeah that's all my com comment Bo-chan? yeah hi Xiaolan. yeah uh personally i believe definitely like what you say definitely is over capacity at this point yeah uh, we everyone can say before the top count expansion in 2021 the overall capacity for perks for the whole world is about 300, 350 gigawatt. Right. However, within the last two years, Topcon experienced a very, very rapid expansions within within two years. Yeah, based on PV Infonic, just now we cited their report this February year. The Topcon launch and the and the plus under construction, the capacity is, is about 800 plus gigawatt. Yeah, that means what? That means we use two years time already completed more than 20 years journey in the past. 
So for the past 20 years, we already have 300, 350 valves. With the last two years, we double these capacities. However, yeah, it looks a bit crazy, yeah. But however, if you look at the bright side, if you look at the CPI, uh, CPIA's report, last year we have produced 400, uh, 545 gigawatt cells. And just now for the IDRPV also mentioned that, for their report also mentioned that uh, for last year, we have produced more than 500 gigawatt cells. Yeah. That means what? That means if the perk cell, like what we see today, is quickly phased out from the market, so although we have 800 plus gigawatt, but it's not fully launched. So probably, yeah, we have 500 gigawatt market, right? And the plus the world increasing demand for the green renewable energies. And the way we see the projections. So I think we can quickly reach to another balance again. Uh, so therefore I still believe the, bright, uh, the future is still very bright. It's just a short term over capacity. Yeah, with these two data. Okay. Right, please. Yeah, I think we all see that the uh, the expansion of this year the, of the top cell is low uh, compared to the 2024 23 and uh, some classic expansion in this year are actually planned already in the 2023 and some are delayed to this year. Uh, and uh, we also see some uh, transformation from the uh, old perk. Uh, capacity to Topcom, but um, uh, only relate uh, limited to some relatively new uh, capacity. And uh, for some very old per capacity, it's difficult to transform to Topcom. And uh, uh, from my uh, view, I think uh, we, we still can see some leading players uh, when their product are uh, very competitive. They still have the expansion plan, no matter to open new capacity or transform the perk capacity to top com. Uh, they still have this kind of plan. I think uh, it's highly uh, related to with their uh, product efficiency, with their cost, um, with their total competitivity. Yeah. Okay. So, so, but actually, do you really see the old capacity is being transferred into top con? Um, are, because at least to uh, my knowledge, most of the guys are really jumping into the new line. Um, maybe because of the production equipment and, uh, you know, Bachan, you also showed how your latest generation uh, equipment has doubled the throughput. And, and Joshua, as you said, you know, you were, now you have uh, a, a production tool that can do simply double the, the throughput. So in these scenarios, uh, in this scenario, do you really see anyone really transforming for to Topcon or, you know, Put part to production as long as it makes sense, but then focus everything on top con with the new capacity. Just you are. Yeah, yeah that's that's true. That, that, that's true. Actually, most customer they uh, they open a new capacity, and uh, for those uh, transformation usually happens only at the capacity that opened at, after two thousand twenty. Uh, at that at that time, some customer when they uh, invest invest in perk. Uh, they they uh, foresee that the top con will come uh, come into the mass production, so they uh, leave some room and leave some uh, transform uh, uh, room for the no matter for the uh, the fab factory or no matter for the uh, equipment. So actually, we still see some new perk capacity. They they can transform to the top con, uh, but for most capacity before two thousand twenty, maybe uh, that kind of transformation is limited. Anyone would like to comment on this? Mm, yeah, to answer uh, this question, actually, we already see if you from the market expansion, you already see this year, we already see the tier one truck cell manufacturers, truck cell manufacturers. Uh, they are already upgrading their lines to top car. Yeah, so this is the main orders in the market in this year, at the first half of the year. And then this reason just now we already mentioned in the presentation is meaning because of the this laser optimization process introduced in the front, they further widen the efficiency gap between the top and the truck. So that's the reason uh, even driven faster for this cell technology, uh, complete this transition. So on the projection, you can see there is almost no doubt today, uh, this year, uh, 
probably from the market share, you can see that yeah, we will complete the technology trans transformations. But as we'll see just now, for very, very old technologies, uh, like, like I mentioned just now, I think they still will remain, uh, probably still have a little bit small market for now. Yeah. So um, are you seeing any trends here? Any specific are, are really global trends or any, any trends you see in this global change in the, in the capacity landscape? Um, for this one, I, I believe just now I say, um, for the past two years, everyone can say the top can become very, very mature already. So we can say that for the new expansion, even the worldwide, everyone will move into top count already. And uh, especially for this large amount, uh, production capacity already proven in the China mainland. So I believe this technology at this moment is mature enough. I think for all the expansions, trends from worldwide, I think, uh, the adoption for the top count will be quite high. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so, uh, you know, uh, can you also comment, anyone of you, you know, how the policy and regulatory frameworks are affecting this global expansion, you know, from the, for the different parts of the value chain, maybe especially out of China, I think the policy and regulatory framework uh, plays a very big role there. So, any anyone from from you? Yeah, I think we see definitely a lot of traction in many countries. I think it's difficult to generalize because all the different regions have a bit of different viewpoint or different strategy of how to address it and where on the supply chain to address it. So you have US, which goes more or less all in and addresses the whole supply chain from ingot up to modules. Mm -hmm. And then if other players where you more have a, let's say a step-by-step -step where you start now with module uh, manufacturing support and then want to go upstream, and I definitely see a big part going towards, okay, there is a consent that it has to be partly diversified over the globe and not just being concentrated in China. And therefore you can see how the policies are coming. And this also brings really traction and brings new players or Chinese players that move part of their manufacturing capacities into the new your regions. Martin? Yeah, we, uh, I think this question uh, we can just see from the news, or recent news, you can see, no matter US, for the Southeast Asia, we are discussing about some uh, tariffs. And uh, recently we see the news from India, yeah, from the Europe also. And definitely every location we will probably will have some policies but yeah, um, I think uh, that's how we cope with uh, uh, these changes. Probably we have to shift shift our manufacturing to the particular location. That's why we see also the trends. More and more cell manufacturers move to US or at least planning to set up their factories in the US. Yeah, I think it still depends on the market. If a market cake is big enough, I think uh, the value chain is not an issue. Everyone can move. Okay, so then now uh, I think I will uh, ask a couple of questions to Yu Chen. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the vapor is really the key material for cell processing. And are you really happy with the progress in vapor processing you have seen over the last year or, or not? Yeah, uh, in the past two decades, I, I mean, monoscript monocrystal wafer they already did a lot so currently um the price i'm not sure about the do in dollars but in 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 chinese yuan they were they were going to 1.3 yuan per wafer they were definitely already reached really down to the to the bottom i mean the price part so it's also not only by the market chain they were presumed but also with the technical part they were doing a lot of uh, 
on the technical progress. So, um, and also not only for uh, for only Longi part, but all the whole production line, they all can do really well on the on the load part, on the price, on the cost control part, on the RCD how they con control, and also P type moving to N type. So everything they were the whole production line they they did really well on the past the two past the two years. Yes, so we we can make it. Nowadays, the, the wafer part, they were like a very um, equally product they were doing. So that's why we were trying to find another way, which is a, a different way to making tyro, wafer, tyro wafers. So currently, I think the wafer has already did a lot of progress on, on the past the technical improvement. So they that's why they were doing now. They can moving to really low price to the whole market. Okay, so it really, since you picked up this topic, uh, the TCZ very interesting, very innovative. So, um, but uh, just uh, going one step back, um, unlike in past, where was it was only P type, and of course at the time you have one alternate mono versus poly, but now there are different cell technologies. And you also mentioned that there are different resistivity threshold are the standards deviations for each cell technology and probably for each cell line, right? So is this making your job more difficult so that you know one size fits for all may not be working so much as it was in past? <clears throat> because now not only that you have several cell makers with huge capacities, you also have different cell technologies. So there is PERC, there is also Topcon, and there is there is really even Longji is doing HBC, and there are a couple of other BC guys, and there is of course a larger chunk is also going into heterojunction. So as from a wafer supplier perspective, how this changing cell technologies is is affecting your job as a wafer supplier. From technology, perspective. yes, of course, it's our job to to matching different cell technology to matching even the same cell technology, different player, different production line. They were like using tongue of the wafers. They were using a lot of wafer and making mass production line, and this they were making mass production. So that's why this new new terra wafer is what we want to do. Is we don't want to give provide to the all customer with one certain um, production wafers and with a, a normal standard. So we would like to test with our, cooperate with our customers in different cell technology, in different cell production line, provide them the, the perfect opt, optim, optimized bark resistivity, the wafers to this certain cell production line and making their cell production line making more stable and more higher efficiency. That's what we would like, would like to do. And also with no additional cost in, increased. That's what is the, the, the addition, original technical intent, what we would, I would like to do. So, um, with 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 your technology, the TCZ technology now the the resistivities are really very tight, very with very very lowest degradation. So, is this um, suitable to every everyone? Or still you have to make some changes with respect to the productions of cell technologies? Oh uh, yeah, actually for for N type technology for N type cell technology. Uh, we all can use TRCZ to control the the distribution of the resistivity. So for we can matching it to the TBC to HBC to Topcon, and uh, and also uh, the thing is, uh, this is one thing is we narrow the resistivity. Another thing is after the building scattering inside the cell technology like Topcon, like a TBC and like, a, and uh, but also with additional gathering like a, 
usually the hydrojunction or HBC customer, they will have additional gathering. They will combine to the, their self-production line. They also can work after gathering and building gathering, additional gathering. They can narrowing the lifetime part because they can get a lot of them as other uh, like can, they could get ring more metal intrinsic metal impurities so they make it improve the lifetime so this is a this is an n type but also on p type we have a serious another technology which is also narrowing the resistivity on on gallium wafer so it also works okay so I think the TCZ is really all about the ingot grow, growing mechanism, right? So just uh, as far as the next step, if you look into the crystal ball and see, is it going to be the same wire sauce used for the wafer cutting? Or uh, do you see any chance for these epi wafers? You know, again, one more revolution in terms of wafer factories, but in a different step. Yeah, um, for slicing, we were using slurry slicing, moving to diamond wire slicing, and now there's a tungsten diamond wire slicing. There's an, another technology trying to apply. They can go thinner wafer, more tense on the on the line part. So um, yes, this is also still a way uh, we were trying to keep in on the diamond wire slicing, uh, tungsten wire, diamond wire slicing. And also they can go thinner and even thinner than less than 110, they can they can work for this. So we were thinking for a further several longer years, they still diamond wire slicing is a way. <laughs> and um, for AP, it depends on the cost. So everything we were doing the calculation nowadays, the, the slicing, they were less than less than 0.3 yuan per per wafer slicing after just the on slicing part. So they were already cheap enough and thin enough and uh, getting the throughput yield good enough on, on the slicing wafer part. So only if the epi part, they can have the really good cost effective competitive to this one, they might work. Okay, I think you answered very diplomatically. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, uh, now I want to go to Bochan and Joshua. So when you look whatever seen in, in ITR PV presentation, so do you agree with the forecast for Topcon because you guys are working more closely with Topcon producers. So what's your uh, in general you know, take on an ITR PV, like, you know, the shares or the emitter doping profile. Uh, of course, I think you, you might have a different opinion for the deposition technology shares, but uh, still, you, you are overall. Yeah, so I think generally the, the shares, I think we, we, we agree more or less on it. I think the transition might happen faster from towards Topcon and Perk might even vanish faster, but that's always hard to say, but it seems to be a very fast transition now. Then similar for head junction, IBC and perovskite there, it's anyway, then more of a question because especially on the cost side, it seems to be very challenging. So they're, yeah, difficult. In terms of emitted doping, there, I definitely see that the shallow emitter goes even higher. So 185 for homo homogeneous emitter is, is reasonable or even higher. What I dare see, what I do not so much agree is on this, it seems to be very dominating by selective emitter, while the laser induced metallization is coming. In, in China, it's, it starts to be standard. And the benefits are clear. So there I see there is a much faster trend away from selective emitter and back to a just how much homogeneous emitter with something in the range of 185 or even above. What's that? Okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, to me, it's like, I feel like the market share for different technology, I think both the IDR PV or PV, PV encoding, actually from the data we showed here, you can see the trend is the same. 
So both of them are green this year. Uh, Topcon will replace, they will swap the position between the program and Topcon. I think this trend definitely is the same. It's just a little bit different is the market share for the program and Topcon. For the PV info link, probably as just not say in between of 20 to 30. And uh, for the IDR PV in between of 30 to 40. So personally, I, I, I think from the, I look at the market for our dear one, customer here is upgrading from the product to Topcon. Personally, I feel like uh, ITR PV could be maybe a little bit conservative, maybe because, but this also happening only recently, uh, after January of this year, probably yeah. this factor is not putting into account for their, uh, for ITR PV's roadmap. So I think that this might be a little bit different. Yeah, this is for the market share. For the emit, for the emitter doping, actually, uh, currently the emitter doping, we are really at a, a moving towards to homogeneous, we are really moving to 150 already. Yeah, um, for future, how fast we'll move to 185, it depends because now the market share is shrinking for the homogeneous. I think this question, uh, Dr. Go maybe is the best one to answer how they are going to optimize their pace for the higher, higher share. <laughs> so I think this progress is controlling the pace company. Yeah, like as they, they do a very good sharing is uh, after introduce the laser uh, firing process. Actually, we can see Today, even today, after introducing the, the uh, laser firing process, actually homogeneous we already moved to 400, if I'm not wrong, right? Dr. Go, is it 400 already for the homogeneous? With the, yeah, with actually, the, the, the RCD is very, we are very sensitive to the RCD because a little oh. improvement in the <laughs> RCD, so we have to change our pace. Uh, actually, yeah, I, uh, maybe the test standard is quite different from different customer and uh, maybe different from ITI, uh, ITIPV. And uh, most customer actually uh, with non-SC homogeneous uh, emitter, actually their R sheet uh, is already more than 200. Uh, some customer actually already adopt uh, 400 in the mass production. But I think there is my, there might be some uh, test standard variation actually with the uh, ECV curve, we uh, uh, we we guess the true uh, R sheet uh, among all the uh, most customers are actually uh, between two hundred to three hundred. I think that's the uh, case for uh, for nowadays. And uh, for the future, I think it's difficult to say. Uh, uh, already, we have some customer trying five hundred R sheet. Uh, uh, and also uh, the, the paste can work on that kind of emitter. So uh, in the past several months, we uh, changed from uh, SE to non-SE and changed to 300 ASHI. I think the uh, optimization would be very quick. Yeah. Thanks for Dr. Goh's explanation. I think he is more <laughs> right for this question, more professional for this question. Uh, that is true, that is true. Yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, you know, you, you saw several, uh, hundreds of gigawatts, uh, you know, are close to hundreds of gigawatts of top con. So, um, what are your key learnings uh, in during this this process? Mm. Top two key learnings. What you what you find it more fascinating or more irritating? Yeah, we, what we know here is really is a very customer driven industry. So as well, you see for this rap rapid expansion for the past two years, we need to provide a new model where with a higher throughput, lower cost for almost every three months to six months for the last two years. Then you can imagine how pressurized is you, can, you need to introduce a new model. I think same story will happen to my friends like Dr. Gold about the pace every time change they will, they will request. So I think this expansion is also a painful journey. Uh, it's a very, very tough journey. Yeah. And this is also how we can, you can see how we can double the ALD and the, both the ALD and the PCBD tube, we, we basically double on them within three years. And the ODC because of the, mainly is still because of the past, customer driven. Yeah, they have this demand. So we have to meet the industry needs. Yeah. Jeshma? Yeah, I, I totally agree on that. That it, I think what I'm always fascinating is how fast still it's moving again. You think, okay, now we are at the next level and you think it's kind of like that thing, but again, a few months later, the new request and you need to be on a complete next level again, and especially on the throughput. 
but also efficiency improvements and cutting costs. It's moving extremely fast and you have new requests coming in of how to adjust it, how to be more aligned between the different tools in terms of the throughput. And therefore it's really, it's a very fast, you need to have a very fast learning curve to, to adjust your tools to the customer's needs. And okay. I think there, especially on the automation side, we have seen the, the big challenges of really just getting, being able to keep the breakage rate so low when you your wafer gets thinner and thinner and thinner so fast and bigger at the same time. So you need to adjust the tools all the time to the new um, standard. So, you know, both of you were also focused uh, a few slides on turnkey solutions. So is it really becoming big, uh, this turnkey business model from the equipment side? I think from our point of view, it's mainly on the international market. It's more interesting than in China. In China, the customers, these are most of them, they, they know very well how to run their factory. They anyway prefer picking and do their own setup and have a huge R&D team to afterwards optimize the processes. But when we look at the international market, there, there is a lot of know-how that got lost in how to manufacture. And for them, it's very difficult if you've set up a factory from scratch by cherry picking, and then you have to train your people, you don't have guarantees. So in the international market, I definitely see turnkey solutions as the choice that most customers want even bigger than turnkey solutions just for a cell line, but say we want to have turnkey solution from ingot to modules. We would like to have one player that, because we have the finance, we want to have here a production locally, but we don't have to know how, how to do it. And this is where we jump in and can guide them and help them to get through all these steps and train a local team so that you're able afterwards to manufacture on a high quality. So, you know, uh, both of you, you have showed that, you know, your respective technologies are the paths you have followed are better. So just to hit a common ground, can you say, you know, what are the two top most advantages of your technology and uh, two kind of limitations with, with your respective technologies, LPCBD and NPCBD and solution. Uh, yeah, to me, first, I think it's a tough question to answer, first of all. But uh, to me, as a technical guy, I, I would like to say there is no perfect technologies. You can imagine initially with, with the PPCBD as a roadmap for the IPRPD, it has a lot of advantage. But before we have the technology breakthrough, it also have a lot of bottleneck. Without solving its own drawbacks, it, the advantage is meaningless. So I think no matter PSVD, LPCVD, as you can see from the market of most half half with me, they all have the big support behind and the both has their advantage and disadvantage. So we are trying to just to uh, include the drawback of the technology we choose and give the customer one more option to choose. Yeah. If you talk about technically, uh, the advantage for uh, PSVD method definitely is the institute doping, uh, which solve the wraparound issue with a higher yield. I think this is one thing. Like the institute masking can help you to simplify the process. And as well as the cost of consumption, as I mentioned, yeah, because this one, PSVD method don't have this problem after this mesh technology mesh production for two years. However, the drawback uh, we also well know for this process is that uh, obviously the PSVD method has a lot more parameters to control. You, you gain a lot of advantage, but on the other hand side is you need a very uh, competent team uh, or, or experienced people to, to handle this process. Yeah, because there are more parameters you have to tune to meet your special needs. Yeah. 
yeah, this is uh, this is pro and cons at this moment. Yeah. Okay. Joshua. Yeah, I I think for us the biggest advantage of LPCVD is really on the integrity of the silicon oxide layer. I think in a topcon device, the silicon oxide layer is the most crucial part. And there, it's just that the uh, thermal silicon oxide is the is closest to SiO2 and is the, the best in terms of performance of passivation. And what we see is especially when we move forward to XPC or polysilicon cells, then or polysilicon finger cells, then it's becoming very important that this layer can work as edge barrier for laser ablation and so on. And this is one big point that I really see a big benefit from the LPCVT. And as presented earlier, that on the cost side, we just see it, that it's much cheaper on the LPCVT um, compared to the PCVT. I think, as Bochum was saying before, one big advantage is the in situ doping for the PCVD. So there, PCVD has more options. But for me, I don't see it in TopCon as a big advantage because you still need that in annealing afterwards. And so for me, with the wraparound, there we see it for PVD, which has a proper no wraparound. But the small wraparound of PCVD, even though small in LPCVD, it still remains. It, you still need the same wet chemistry straps afterwards to remove it. But of course, I think one of the shortcomings is the less parameters to tune. So especially when we think of new gases or new parameters that you want to bring in, then the PCVD has an advantage. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Okay, so then uh, I would uh, have a few questions for Frank Wing. So, you know, Materials are really giving the big boost to TopCon. Uh, right now, the, the laser uh, enhanced process is really the talk of the PV town. So is it really commercially, fully commercialized? Yeah, I think it's fully commercialized. And from the from our data, almost uh, very close to 100% of the TopCon capacity are using the laser technology now. And, and is there any special requisites from the laser front, you know, from the hardware, uh, the equipment front? Uh, actually, the overall, the efficiency benefit uh, with different laser equipment, uh, very close at the beginning stage uh, when customer into this technology. Uh, while with the uh, uh, later, with the process optimization, uh, different laser equipment do have some impact on the pace choice at uh, both the front side and the rear side. Um, some equipment uh, uh, prefer pace with better FF, uh, while some prefer better VOC. And uh, this also might impact the uh, EL performance, especially as some cells with very high uh, contact requirement. Uh, I think uh, after all, uh, the pace choice is very sensitive to the cell process. Uh, no matter the, the emitter or the laser equipment. So uh, I think still uh, uh, it has the difference on the, it, it has the different uh, uh, impact to the, to the cell efficiency. But uh, uh, it's difficult to say uh, the, how the uh, equipment, at, uh, which, which equipment is better because the different cell process uh, may need different kinds of equipment. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'm, I don't know whether I caught you uh, exactly or not. So I still have this doubt, like, you know, earlier the, the emitter phase for the top gun are aluminum dope. And uh, so initially, mostly people were talking about a few silver paste. So how is it now? Is it aluminum dope paste or it's a pure silver paste uh, for, for uh, the laser assisted process? Uh, yeah, actually, the aluminum is not uh, necessary for the paste now. Uh, but, but whether using aluminum or not is kind of largely defined by the cell process and the glass-free design. Uh, some glass-free, uh, if you put some aluminum powder in it, actually it's, uh, help to balance the uh, VOC in the FF. Uh, may help to, to support, uh, to get better efficiency. But some gas, uh, you remove the uh, aluminum, that's, that's okay. And you can still get very high efficiency. 
so it's highly related with the custom process and uh, with the glass design. And uh, but uh, but no matter but even though we put some aluminum powder in the paste, the function of the aluminum is totally different with the standard silver aluminum paste. Uh, the content is usually greatly reduced and uh, actually has very low impact to uh, recombination, uh, low impact to the printability or the reliability. So uh, nowadays the aluminum actually works as a additive to the paste. Okay. Yeah. So, so that means uh, from DKM, uh, you supply both or you, you chose a part? Actually, we supply both. Ah, okay. So, uh, you know, uh, what is the effect of this, uh, this laser assisted process on module CTM? So how much of this benefit is really transferred into the module level? Can you comment on that? Uh, yeah, actually, that's a very interesting question. And uh, we do hear from the industry that uh, uh, some customer feedback, the, the, the power benefit at the module level is not uh, as much as the efficiency gain at the cell level. Uh, but there, I think there's no still no solid data to show this is related with the, the, the laser process or not. Uh, uh, more data actually are still under collection by customer and us. And uh, uh, Actually, but at the very early stage, we also did some study of the different paste system uh, of the liquid paste to see the stability of the contact point formed by the laser. Uh, actually, some paste, some, some glass, uh, do show worse heat resistance cap uh, capability. Uh, so uh, if you uh, heat the, the, uh, the cell, uh, like a, a similar process to the uh, module uh, uh, soldering or the lamination, uh, we do see some FF drop, and uh, but some glass they don't. So uh, this is related to, to the paste design and also related to the uh, cell and module design, the module the process. So, uh, uh, but this actually this case also happened at some silver aluminum paste, uh, silver uh, aluminum system. Uh, but the freeze nowadays, the freeze loading is greatly reduced. And uh, actually, the content point is uh, not as strong as the silver aluminum paste. So this phenomenon becomes actually become more sensitive to the uh, module production, uh, like uh, soldering and lamination. So uh, I think uh, that's the true phenomenon, but the conclusion is still not solid. Uh, uh, actually, we, all, we all already have this kind of study, and we have the solution for this kind of requirement. Uh, and it's actually it has been tested as a customer. Okay, great. I, I think we are also coming to the very uh, close end of our conference. So I'll have one final question, um, very quick one. So what will be your main product in three years from now and how it will look different from what customers are ordering today? Be it efficiency, throughput, cost, what's, what's your main product development roadmap for the next three years. Maybe we will meet in the same conference and discuss. Yuchen, I think it's been long you spoke something. So from you first. Um, I think for later three years, the most important for our product is to take care of the customer needs. And it's for, better quality, better service uh, for the customer requirements. It's not like throughput because we already have a lot of throughput out <laughs> and the cost is already low enough and we have a lot of capacities. So the most important thing is, um, especially on the, on the panel part, module part, and they have to find a different scenario to use solar panel and also from the our customers because we were uh, really upstream so for the wafer part especially for the cell production line they were all really mature they were all high efficiency they were all really um upgrade and upgrade so what we what we need to do is we need to customization we need to um help them and mutually to improve the quality and finding the the real um, manufacturer needs and we were solving those problems 
that's the way. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Yeah. What's hand, maybe? Mm, question. Yeah. Uh, for me personally, I feel like it still depends on what is the market needs. Yeah, what are the cell technology actually years? You know, PV industry is always a cost efficiency driven industry. These are the cost and efficiency are the two components. Throughput also representing part of the cost. So I believe that the cost will continue decreasing and the efficiency will continue improving until it reaches the bottom net like the park today. So I'm not sure whether Pokemon still exists after three years <laughs> because, the park, because the park only five to eight years. So probably after three years, yeah, we are still, if lucky, we still have Pokemon because there are still several technology we can add on. Uh, however, we are also preparing for the another cell technologies. Just now we mentioned that we are going to share in the in solar. Yeah, so it depends on the market. So we are also preparing us for different cell technologies. Yeah. Joshua? Yeah, I'm, I'm jumping directly. In. I think, I mean, it's not the right place to announce now the new tools or what is coming. But of course, we are we are working on and seeing the market, what is coming. And three years is a long time horizon. So it's definitely new tools will be out there for different technologies or for, for TopCon, as we have seen now with the laser-induced metallization, for example, it can go quite fast that it's coming and then um, it will be adapted. And the market is, is very fun taking the new technologies and using them. But I definitely also see a trend more on the on customization. So many have now a specific technology they want to have for their modules, slightly different tools they want to have because of a specific wafer type, slightly different tools so that you have some slight adjustments and not just one tool fits all approach. This is one trend that, that we are seeing. And then on the tool side itself, the capacity is still increasing and this will go on like this. And I think it goes more into the, in the turnkey solution side that TopCon will get into TBC or polyphenols. So there will be um, advanced technologies that boost the efficiency of the TopCon even further. Okay. Franklin, do, do, would you like to add anything to it? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, as a material company, uh, we don't decide what kind of product we mm -hmm. offer. Actually, our customers decide that. Uh, but from, uh, from the current uh, product uh, structure, uh, I think that the, uh, the silver paste for Tokong and for AJT, uh, TBC, HBC will be the main product from, uh, from DKEM. Uh, and uh, uh, still, I think the top con because it, uh, now it shows very high efficiency, high efficiency and very low cost uh, compared to the other product to the uh, the other cell structure. The top con product will still be the uh, dominate product. And uh, uh, for the actually for a customer, they always require the uh, both efficiency and the cost for the silver paste. Uh, when they want to improve their cell efficiency, they, they come to the paste company. When they want to reduce the cost, the first thing they, they think about is to reduce the price of the silver and reduce the uh, cost of the, uh, reduce the assumption of the silver paste. So uh, for us, uh, how to improve the cell efficiency uh, by the paste design and uh, how to reduce the, the silver, uh, silver paste laid down uh, to match customer needs will be the actually will be our target. Perfect. So thank you very much for this uh, very uh, you know deep insights on various technology topics, and uh, I really appreciate your great insights and your contribution to our conference. So here I would like to uh, close the conference with a couple of uh, closing remarks. Thank you all. <laughs>